Hello again, friends, and welcome back to our weekly channel. Today, we're going to cover our personal top 20 favorite list of cars that were manufactured between 1965 and 1969. Because this is our all-time favorite time period, there are so many cars that are worthy candidates. We hope your favorite car is on our list, and even if it isn't, we hope you learned something new today. With this 1965 to 69 list, it was very difficult to name most cars specifically, so many of the entrants are all inclusive, like the 65 through 69 Shelby Cobras and Mustangs. The list was assembled more by emotion than logic, or current value, or anything else like that. We just love these cars. It was a difficult list to assemble, but here it is. These are in no particular order whatsoever. So enough of this video intro, let's see what we've got. 1968 and 69 AMC, AMX, and Javelin. As the pony car wars really heated up the last two years of the 60s, the smallest company building cars for the American market, AMC, knew they also had to field an entrant into this huge market segment. Their reply to all the Mustangs, Camaros, Firebirds, and Barracudas was the stylish Javelin. Because of budget constraints, the Javelin would only be available in one body style, not two like most other competitors, or even three like the Mustang. But like all the others, the Javelin could be ordered with a host of different options, ensuring that if you ordered one, it may have truly been one of a kind. Javelins left Kenosha, Wisconsin equipped from classy looking personal luxury cars to all out fire breathers, just three months after debut of this model, the two-seater AMX debuted at Daytona. At first glance, it seemed like all the engineers did was shorten the wheelbase, but there were many subtle differences. There were also several innovations created by American Motors that were industry firsts for both models, including a one-piece plastic molded dash assembly. That first year, the AMX set over 100 speed-related records at the Goodyear Tire Test Track. American Motors Group Vice President Vic Raviolo stated that the AMX was designed to, quote, appeal to both muscle car and sports car enthusiasts, two camps that rarely acknowledge each other's existences, unquote. The problem was the tire melting acceleration of the two-seater made it a quick car that handled like a sports car, confusing the buying public. Automotive journalist Tom McCahill summed it up, saying, quote, The AMX is the hottest thing to ever come out of Wisconsin, and you can whip through corners and really hard bends better than with most out-and-out -out sports cars, unquote. It was also the only American-built, steel-bodied, true two-seater of its time, the first since the 55-57 to 57 Ford Thunderbird. Because the AMX was so quick and nimble, AMC knew this car would be their entry into the newest form of racing in America, the Trans Am series. They did quite well and really brought notoriety to the number four automaker. All the while the Javelin was racking up sales because of the racing program, especially to buyers who needed a back seat in their car. American Motors marketed the Javelin as offering, quote, comfortable packaging with more interior and luggage space than most of its rivals." Unquote. The Javelin continued to be sold by AMC in various models through the end of the 1974 model year. There was never a car available that looked like the Javelin and its AMX cousin, and to this day when one is seen, there's no doubt of its heritage. This, at least to us, is another great example of how the smaller manufacturers as underdogs in the industry can innovate a car unlike any of their competitors. Duesenberg, Cord, Studebaker, and so many others had done it before. We should be glad that AMC took a chance. Now we have these beautifully elegant and sexy cars to show for it. 1966 and 67 Ford Fairlane 390 GT and Mercury Comet 390 GT. To compete mostly with the Pontiac GTO, but many other models to a lesser degree, 
Ford counterpunched with a total redesign of their intermediate Ford and Mercury cars in 1966. Now larger in size to accept a big block engine, both were available as a hardtop and a convertible. Although the cars seem similar from one year to the next and model to model, there are many subtle differences. In 1966, the 390 GT engine had a cast iron intake, usually sporting a cast in S with a Holley Performance Type 4 barrel carb with a chrome open element air cleaner, a hotter camshaft, a clutch fan, a chrome dress up package under hood, and free flowing exhaust manifolds and mufflers all conspired to pump 335 horses out of the reliable FE big block. Inside, bucket seats and a console were standard. On the outside, both cars had specific model ornamentation and special stripes along the rocker panels. The Mercury even had a fiberglass scooped hood and special wheel covers. Underneath, both cars had heavy duty suspensions. Very cool. Both GT cars had similar options and sold fairly well, despite the competition posed by both GM and Chrysler. 1967 would be an entirely different scenario. In addition to several new safety equipment requirements mandated by the feds, these cars were noticeably different than the previous year. As to the Fairlane, the GT model was still available, but now was standard with the 289 two-barrel engine. The 390 GT was now available as an option, but was also now rated at 320 horsepower. Exterior styling cues and ornamentation were refreshed, and inside, the console was now also on the option list. Still, a nicely equipped GT could be had if ordered carefully. At the Mercury camp, the GT also had its exterior styling subtly altered, but the 390 GT engine was still standard when lifting up that fiberglass scooped hood. By the way, despite urban legend, GT cars could not be optioned with a 427 engine from the factory, although some may exist. We'd suspect they're all transplants. Today, these cars are getting harder to find, but patience will still reveal a good, solid car, and not for a huge sum of money. Many enthusiasts seek out and buy the lesser models and modify them to today's standards. A lot of parts are available as repros, but many are not. As always, it's advisable to get a car as complete as possible before beginning your restoration. They're a nice sized car, have plenty of power, look great, and won't be commonly seen at every cars and coffee or cruise night. Happy hunting! Chevrolet, any L79 small block, 327, 325, or 350 horsepower. It can be convincingly argued that Chevrolet's L79 V8 engine option is perhaps one of the best small blocks ever built by any American manufacturer. Mainly because of the Corvette, the small block Chevy evolved into the 327 in 1962. In just four short years, engineers turned it into this hot little number, which was only produced from 1965 to 68, and found under the hoods of Corvettes in those years, plus the 66 to 68 Chevy 2 models, and in the Malibu El Camino series in 1965, 67, and 68. Depending on the year and model, these potent engines produced either 325 or 350 horsepower. Any car powered by this awesome engine usually had a favorable power to weight ratio. A lighter engine over the front wheels would naturally yield a car with better handling and braking characteristics than a similar big block car. Back in the days the L79 was an option, a knowledgeable buyer could order any car except a Corvette and have it come in under three G's. These were fun, fast, and highly streetable. Hard to believe, but the standard transmission for the non-Corvette offerings was the three-speed manual, with a four-speed manual and a two-speed automatic power glide being the two optional gearboxes. These cars would definitely be street sleepers. Many of the L79 packages included a chrome dress-up package and that magnificent dual snorkel air cleaner. Prices seem to be creeping up on these, especially if it has documentation. So if you want one, 
You'd better buy one in the next year or two before prices become stratospheric. 1968 and 1969 Dodge Super B and Plymouth Roadrunner. As we all know, Chrysler had been in the performance car business since the early 50s when the different divisions were building Hemi-powered automobiles. Once head stylist Virgil Exner introduced the forward look cars in 1955, the suits at Chrysler knew that in order for some of these unconventional designs to sell, they had to go like hell. A few years of continuous development brought the 413 and 426 Max Wedge cars, and then the legendary 426 Hemi. In 1968, the company tried it with both a Dodge, called the Super B, and a Plymouth, called a Roadrunner. Both were more successful than originally projected, so the guys at Mopar would improve these cars for the following year. Trouble was, other car companies got wind over this successful formula, prompting them to issue new models in the low price field. Chevrolet reimagined the base Supersport, and Pontiac brought us a GTO Judge, while Ford brought us the Fairlane Cobra, while sister division Mercury debuted the Cyclone CJ. Even American Motors developed the Hearst-built Rambler, known as the SC Rambler. A period of unique cars was over all too soon. The interesting thing about these cars is that although they were intended to be low-price, entry-level muscle cars, most buyers would order them loaded up with options and accessories, which always equals more profits for the automakers. Unfortunately, between other types of cars available, older new car buyers and escalating fuel and insurance prices, this type of car, like all the other muscle car brethren, were doomed to be relegated to the annals of history. Now, these types of muscle cars are amongst the most popular with restorers, collectors, and investors. Even the base model Mopars, with the 383 engine and a 4-speed, are bringing crazy money, and when these base cars are equipped with Hemi engines, or even the 446 barrel, they just keep appreciating year after year. Chevrolet Chevelle and El Camino the Chevelle was introduced for the 1964 model year. Chevrolet needed a car sized between the Nova and the Impala. It was available as a hardtop, a convertible, two or four-door wagons, and two and four-door sedans. The El Camino that year was also based on this handsome new design, the first time this hybrid car truck was available since 1960, when it was derived from Chevy's full-size car. The Chevelle would be part of a new and later very popular A-body series that GM built millions of cars off this platform. Buick had the Skylark, Oldsmobile the Cutlass, and Pontiac the Tempest Le Mans. Of course, every submodel imaginable was also part of this family of cars. The first two years sales were good, but for performance enthusiasts, the best available engine was the 327L79. This engine was pretty stout from the factory and responded well to easy mods like headers and a bigger carb. These 64 and 5 models were a nice size for nearly every buyer. Oh yeah, one footnote I'd like to mention is that in 1965, about 200 Chevelles were fitted with the new Big Block 396. These were known by their option code Z16. The big news for Chevelle customers came in 1966 with a newly designed car that could now be optioned with three different versions of the Hot 396. There was the L35, rated at 325 horses, the L34, putting out 350, and the badass 375 horse L78. Like their competitors, these cars had many options to ensure each buyer could equip his or her car exactly as they wanted it. The following year, except for some minor styling changes and the federally mandated safety related items, these cars continued to be big sellers for GM. The ultra cool two door wagon was dropped in 1966. The El Camino could also be equipped with any of the 396s, but were not available with a performance oriented Supersport package until 1968 when the Chevelle was the recipient of another radical styling change. Now, a buyer could get the El Camino equipped just like its Chevelle cousin, 
but had a bed in which a half ton of cargo could easily be transported. The 69 El Caminos received the same subtle styling updates the Chevelle did and could be optioned very similarly as the previous models. Buick Sport Wagon and Olds Vista Cruiser Although most cars on this list are muscle cars, we're particularly fond of wagons, and there's nothing cooler than these Vista Dome in the Roof models made by GM. Inspired by the Vista Dome observation cars seen in passenger train consists since the classic era of rail travel, this type of roof on an automobile was certainly a novel idea. First seen in 1964 from both divisions, this unique take on a station wagon, which by the mid-60s was the single largest sales category for all the different automakers, always gets our attention. Stylists knew that wagon buyers, even though most had families, still liked their family haulers to have style and appeal. You couldn't do any better than either of these in your driveway. No other company offered anything this cool during the height of station wagon popularity, except maybe Studebaker with their Lark Wagonaire. These Buicks and Oldsmobiles were available with two or three rows seating, plus a huge list of options so a buyer could truly make a car his or her own. They were built on a 5-inch extended wheelbase over the standard Buick Skylark sedans and wagons, as well as the Oldsmobile Cutlass and F85 sedans and wagons. The first and second generation sport wagons and Vista Cruisers are revered for their fixed glass, roof-mounted glass panels over the second row seating area. Sun visors for the second row passengers were standard. Finally, a raised roof behind the skylight and lateral glass panels over the rear cargo area were all notable styling features of these cars. Although both the sport wagons and the Vista Cruisers were available until the end of the 1977 model year, the last glass roof wagons were built through 1972. They're cherished by collectors and bring to mind a bygone era where designers in Detroit were not limited in their creativity. Chevrolet Camaro Z28 When the Mustang was first introduced in the spring of 1964 as a 65 model, sales were huge and General Motors really had nothing to compete with this new vehicle category, dubbed the Pony Car. Work commenced almost immediately, and GM wanted to fast-track a competitive, all-new Pony Car into this huge market. In 1967, Chevrolet debuted the now-legendary Camaro, and Pontiac also had a sister car in the Firebird. The problem was, many other Pony Cars were now on the market from Mercury and Plymouth, and many more were nearing engineering completion for new models for the 1968 and beyond years. The biggest advantage Chevrolet had was that the Camaro would have engines of all types available right away. Six cylinders and small and big block V8s could all be ordered right from the factory. They were also available in two body styles, unlike some of their early competitors. The Camaro was immediately positioned to take a lot of sales from Ford and Chrysler in 1967, as was the Firebird. And they sure did. The inaugural year, the Camaro tallied up 220,906 units sold, which was still far less than the Mustang's 472,121 cars. But Ford was feeling the pressure. The Z28 was a very specialized car. Trans Am and other types of road racing were gaining popularity in the U.S., so many were put on the track. Chevrolet knew that most race teams would need factory support in the form of high-performance parts and technical info. The power-to-weight ratio on the Camaro was perfect, plus the factory began offering many engineered parts and components that added to the factory-rated 290 horsepower. A visit to your dealer yielded performance camshafts, factory headers, a cross-ram dual four intake, functional ram air, digger axle gears, and more. The Z28 package got its name from the option code for this small block high performance Trans Am racer, which was street legal but could be modified for a lot more power than in its stock configuration. In 1967, this option code was not publicized in any dealer available information 
or in most of the other enthusiast magazines of the day. Consequently, only 602 units were ever built. The option returned for 1968, but it was well publicized this time, and nearly 7,200 were sold. However, 1969 would total the highest production numbers of the first-gen Camaro at 20,302. The Z28 would go on to become one of the most popular Camaro models of all time. Manufactured almost continuously for the past 58 model years, the Z28 is ubiquitous with any reference to a performance Camaro. American Motors SC Rambler Because the muscle car market was, by 1969, so very broad and ultra-competitive, pony cars were still popular too. AMC wanted some of those sales. Sure, in 1968 they offered two sporty models with the AMX and its longer wheelbase cousin, the Javelin. With the right boxes checked on the order form, it was possible to get a very quick and agile performance car that you wouldn't see every day, but AMC realized that something was missing to fulfill the wishes of a small base of their customers. Yep, a bargain-based, no-frills muscle car that was not only fast, but looked the part. No options like air conditioning were allowed because a race car doesn't need it. American Motors subcontracted this new concept street bruiser with the most well-known specialty auto shop that had worked with many different companies through the years, Hearst Automotive. Known for their shifters and other aftermarket performance parts, Hearst also had a talented crew in their custom shop that could create nearly anything the automakers could dream up. In the case of the Scrambler, AMC management knew this car would not be a huge seller because of its specialized market niche, but they also realized they needed an image car out there for everyone to see. Starting with the base model Rambler Rogue two-door hardtop, the boys at Hearst added headers and a free-flow glass-packed muffler system to this beast. In some states, the exhaust note was louder than the legal limit. Then, the cars were all fitted with fiberglass scooped steel hoods with functional underhood ram air, blacked out grills and tail panels, exterior racing bullet style mirrors, blue painted magnum style wheels, red, white, and blue front seat headrests, and sun tachometers on the steering column. But where these really pop is the exterior color scheme. Hearst started production mid-year on these brutes, and turned out 1,512 examples. There were two paint schemes. The A version had almost completely red painted sides, while the B cars had the much subtler red stripes on the side. We couldn't find exact production number breakdowns for both, but it seems most people say the A was applied to about 1,200 cars, while the B was sprayed on around 300 or so scramblers. These cars have a strong enthusiast following and have risen quickly in value over the past five years, now that some critical parts are being reproduced, and there's also a lot more knowledge about them. In our opinion, this is one of the coolest muscle cars from the classic era. 1965 and 1966 Ford Mustang High Performance 289K Code Ford began their total performance era in 1963, or at least according to their many advertisements at the time, this meant that they would race their cars all over the world in every type of automotive competition imaginable. Engineers would apply what they learned into Ford's everyday cars, and they promised to make performance cars easily accessible within the nationwide retail dealer network. Ford president Henry Ford II wanted to dominate motorsports anywhere that potential customers would see the cars winning and decide to purchase one for themselves or at least a family-oriented car that was developed with experience gained on the track. In mid-year 1963, Ford introduced a lightweight 90-degree small-block V8 that with the right purpose-engineered components had great potential to power many different cars at racetracks around the world. It displaced 289 cubic inches and utilizing a solid lifter camshaft and a rotating assembly that could easily reach 6,000 RPMs and above quickly and consistently. It became known as a K-code engine or a K-car because the VIN utilized the letter K in its fifth digit to denote this engine. 
First introduced into some limited production fair lanes, this engine quickly dominated every form of motorsport it entered. It quickly became the engine of choice for Carroll Shelby's Cobra and for his newest project for Ford, the GT350, based on a Mustang 2 Plus 2. Its main purpose would be to dominate the Corvettes running in SCCA and other sanctioned events. They succeeded beyond expectations. Ford produced them on three different regular production lines to keep up with demand. As you know, by 1965 the Mustang was the best-selling car in America. Part of their allure is that each one could be custom tailored to its new owner. From mild to wild, stripped to loaded. They didn't sell particularly well compared to the other engine options, but those that got one probably loved it. All the early cars through the 1965 model year were mandatory with four speeds, but an automatic could be ordered for 1966, most likely due to Shelby selling 1,000 cars to Hertz Rent-A-Car. Available in three body styles and many different color and trim choices, along with many options available, few were built exactly the same. The Mustang cut into the sales of the Fairlane. So this engine was dropped in 66 with the Fairlane's restyling. Production continued for the Mustang and Shelby GT350 until the end of 1967. The Mustang was the right car at the right time, as predicted by Ford's Vice President and General Manager of the Ford Division, Lee Iacocca. He had an eerily uncanny ability to read the market and then act on it. To this day, a first-gen Mustang, particularly with this engine, is highly collectible. The Shelby Cousins GT350 is even more sought after, particularly the 65s. 1969 Pontiac Trans Am. As the 1960s rolled on, more auto manufacturers started participating in various motorsport events around the world. The old adage of win on Sunday, sell on Monday was certainly true. Yes, both hardcore race fans and even casual ones enjoyed watching their favorite manufacturer with their hero drivers behind the wheel, trying to take the win on race day. One circuit of racing that really began to grow in popularity during the late 1960s was Trans Am Racing. This sanctioning body, an offshoot of the Sports Car Club of America, had many rules as to how each car could be equipped for safety and to level the playing field for all. Their most important role, however, was to limit the cubic inch displacement of all participants to 305, or 5 liters. By 1969, Ford had Boss 302 Mustangs on the track, General Motors had the Z28 Camaro, Chrysler ran modified darts, and even American Motors got involved with their Javelins. Upper management at Pontiac wanted something in these races too. For 1969, they developed a Firebird-based car that would be called Trans Am. They agreed to pay a royalty to this racing organization for the use of the name as long as they were selling Trans Am cars. In fact, Pontiac supposedly paid a royalty on each car made during the run of this model from 1969 until the end of 2002. The 69 cars are most legendary for Pontiac and muscle car collectors. Just 697 cars are built including a mere eight convertibles. We couldn't find further breakdown numbers for the various engine and transmission combinations. Also, many potential buyers were aware that the Pontiac Firebirds and Chevrolet Camaros, both referred to within the halls of General Motors as F cars, were debuting an entirely new model. So many people wanted to wait for it. These low production numbers on a car that became one of the most celebrated nameplates of all time contribute to their astronomical values. If you can't get a 69, there are many other affordable Trans Ams available. Shelby GT350 and GT500. When discussing iconic muscle cars from the classic muscle car era of the late 60s and early 70s, no list would be complete without mentioning Carroll Shelby and the various cars that he brought to market. Or in the case of the 1968 newer Mustang-based cars, was at least influenced by Old Shell. Starting in 1965, Shelby fielded the legendary 427 Cobras into the hands of a few lucky buyers. That same year, the GT350 debuted as a highly modified and race-ready car 
that could be purchased from any authorized dealer. That year, there were an additional 37 all-out track cars built, called the GT350R. In 1966, Shelby decided to increase sales, so he had to make these cars more civilized. Sales increased over fourfold to 2,380 units, including 1,000 cars for the Hertz rent a car fleet. 1967 was the debut of the GT500, powered by a 428 police interceptor engine sporting dual quads. This was also the last year of Shelby's involvement before Ford took over the entire program. 1968 would bring both the GT350 and GT500 to market plus a new convertible for both series. Mid-1968, the legendary 428 Cobra Jet engine debuted, and these cars were renamed GT500KR for King of the Road. The final year had small and big blocks, fastbacks and convertibles. These cars didn't sell well, so nearly 800 of them were renumbered as 1970 models, and they got hood stripes and a front spoiler to differentiate them from their 1969 cousins. For a program that lasted less than a decade, every car with Shelby's name on it is highly coveted among enthusiasts. If you want to buy one, beware. There are many fakes out there, but there are several resources now to authenticate a car's true pedigree. All Chevrolet Corvettes What can be said about the Corvette? Every car nut knows that the C2 and C3 cars, all built during the 1965-69 to period, had many different performance engines, both small and big block. Along with two very sexy body styles each year, the engineers at Chevrolet always strive to equip each New Year's vet with the latest performance and comfort options. The engines available during those five iconic years include several different versions of the 327 and 350 small blocks and the 396 and 427 big blocks. Transmission availability was also varied depending on the year and engine a buyer selected. A manual 3 or 4 speed as well as 2 and 3 speed automatics could be found behind any of these engines, depending on the year and the engine choice. Of course, today collectors are searching for highly optioned examples with big blocks and 4 speeds, although many buyers prefer the nimbleness of a small block powered car. However you option them, Corvettes from this period are highly sought after, so prices are high. Unless you find a decent project car and you can do most or all of the work yourself, your best economic option is to find an older restoration. Or, dare we say, find a solid car with a non-matching numbers drivetrain. Go through everything for aesthetics, reliability and safety, and then just go out and have fun with it. To this day, the Corvette is a legend among enthusiasts and even non-enthusiasts alike. It was always dubbed as America's sports car, and for good reason. Dodge Charger, 1968 and 1969, plus the Daytona Charger and the Charger 500. We selected these two years because of the natural lead-in to two of Dodge's strictly for racing models that in today's collector market are some of the most desirable and valuable cars of the entire post-war period. The Charger was first seen in dealer showrooms starting with the 1966 model year. While they were handsome cars, they were also big and heavy, two traits not consistent with a performance car. For 1968, engineers penned what we think is one of the most beautiful designs to ever come out of the Chrysler Styling Studios. It was shaped like a Coke bottle and was only available as a hardtop fastback. No convertibles here, friends. Like everyone else, Dodge was called upon to provide cars to the NASCAR team since they were very slippery through the high winds created well above 120 miles per hour. The program looked promising, so engineers soon developed the Charger 500, a car with an extended front end and a differently shaped rear window. It was intended to run the NASCAR circuit, so a minimum of 500 units had to be built and sold to the public. That was accomplished in short order. Making these cars faster had to be through the use of aerodynamics, since horsepower was now maxed out. 
Through extensive wind tunnel and track testing, it was discovered that the tail end of these cars would lift at about 120 miles an hour, so a stabilizer wing was designed to prevent this, thus keeping the car more solidly planted on the track. Of course, the car was called the Daytona Charger, or Charger Daytona. We've seen references made in both configurations. It became a winning combination for all the Dodge teams that had one. Like the 500, a minimum of 500 units had to be built and sold to homologate the body style for competition. The 500 in Daytona came with a 440 four barrel engine as standard equipment, but the Hemi engine was an option. Other than transmission choice, these cars, like their Ford and Mercury NASCAR counterparts, didn't have a very long option list. Today, these cars are some of the most valuable from the muscle car era or any other. We were around during that time and we always were astounded that anyone could go into their local showroom and order a car like this. If we had only known. Ford and Mercury 428 Cobra Jet As the muscle car wars were really heating up by the time Pontiac debuted the GTO in 1964, Ford Motor Company only had the 390 in its many different forms to put into streetcars. Sure, the hard-to-beat 427 was available from mid-63 all the way through 1968, but it was far too temperamental to put into cars that people were going to drive daily. Plus, power steering or air conditioning was something most buyers were not willing to forego. The only 427-equipped model that Ford attempted to civilize for daily duty was the 1968 Cougar GTE. But many of them received Cobra Jets after April of that year. With input from one of Ford's highest volume performance dealers, Tasca Ford, located in Rhode Island, they combined various components from earlier FE engines, including the low riser 427 cylinder heads and the 390 GT hydraulic camshaft. Successful drag strip testing showed that they had a winning combination. After presenting it to Ford, management liked it. Soon, Hot Rod Magazine featured this new engine, and Ford was immediately inundated with letters from people who asked when they could get one. It was quickly decided that all of Ford's and Mercury's muscle cars would have them available by mid-1968. Your local dealer had to be hip to the availability of this powerful new engine, but most any Mustang, Fairlane, Torino, Ranchero, Cougar, Montego, or Cyclone could get one installed at the factory with either a manual 4-speed or a special C6 3-speed automatic. All transferred the 335 horses and 445 foot-pounds of torque. All 68 models had functional underhood ram air as a standard feature of the package, along with heavier suspensions and brakes. The Shelby Edition, seen as both a sports roof and a convertible, was dubbed GT500KR for King of the Road, to differentiate this 428 equipped car from its plain GT500 counterparts. The 50 factory built Mustang factory drag cars, dubbed 135 cars for their VIN codes, made a huge impression at NHRA events in mid 68. Things got more interesting for the 1969 and 70 models. A buyer could choose either Ram Air or non Ram Air and the new drag pack option equipped these cars with steeper gears, an engine oil cooler, 427 Le Mans rods, and a larger harmonic balancer and counterweight. This engine was known as the Super Cobra Jet. Curiously, both the Cobra Jet and the Super Cobra Jet were rated at the same horsepower. All Oldsmobile 442s. Like many of the cars on this list, it was difficult to pin an exact year down for some of the biggest legends, as we're sure you'll agree that this 442 option package truly is. First, we'd like to emphatically state that the correct pronunciation, according to the earliest factory literature, is 442. It's not 442, as we often hear. It designates a performance car with a four-barrel carburetor, a four-speed manual transmission, and dual exhaust. Certainly, over the years, Oldsmobile would modify their model equipment list, sometimes mildly and sometimes more radically, but the name soldiered on. It's truly one of the most iconic names to come out of this era 
or any other for that matter. In 1964, just as sister division Pontiac would set the new car market on its head with the GTO option package, Oldsmobile also fielded a purpose-built, entry-level muscle car. Like Pontiac, it would be an option package and was available on any F85 Cutlass except the station wagon. Yes, it's conceivable that a customer could, and maybe did, order a four-door sedan with this package. What a sleeper. Engineers would put a higher horsepower 330 cubic inch engine in the car. Putting the power to the ground was the standard four-speed manual transmission, all working in sync to turn those beautiful 7.50 by 14 redline tires. Performance-oriented rear axle gears and other options were just a check mark away from being put on your special car at the factory. In later years, tri-power, functional Ram Air, and a huge list of comfort and convenience items to appease those customers that liked the look and feel of a performance car, but also wanted power accessories and air conditioning. Growing to 400 cubic inches and then to 455, such legends as the Hurst Olds in 1968 and the W30 and 31 models all added to the mystique brought to market by a very conservative division of GM that, with few exceptions, was highly regarded by most of their customers as building a solidly reliable and high-quality car. Ford Galaxy 507 Liter By 1966, most buyers of high-performance cars were looking for cars that were smaller and lighter. However, there was a small faction of buyers that wanted performance and comfort in their cars. One car that stands out for its size, styling, long option list, and comfortable interiors is the Ford-built Galaxy 507 liter. Available as a separate model under the code 63D for the hardtop and 76D for the convertible. The package included the new for 66 428 engine, either a four-speed manual or a new C6 automatic, special ornamentation, and bucket seats and console interior and power front disc brakes. In addition, there was a huge list of options. One of the options available was the 427 solid lifter engine. It's doubtful many were ever built. We've only seen two through the years. Although there was a market for these cars, it was small. By year's end, Ford sold only 8,808 hardtops and a mere 2,367 convertibles. To this day, they're among the muscle cars that are rarely seen. When they are, most enthusiasts don't really know what they are. In 1967, this package became an option only on the Galaxy 500 XL. It was now called the 7 liter sports package and was only identified by a small trunk mounted ornament. Even fewer were made. Full size luxury performance car sales were dwindling by the late 60s and it was not a big surprise when you see how many lighter weight cars were available by then. All Pontiac GTOs well, consider the GTO started the muscle car air movement in 1964. It shouldn't surprise anyone that Pontiac was committed to upholding the reputation of this iconic automobile. It seemed each ensuing year would be better and slightly more refined than its predecessor. By 1969, a new model called the Judge was Pontiac's entry into the no-frills muscle car market to compete with the Plymouth Roadrunner, the Dodge Super B, the Ford Fairlane Cobra, the Mercury Cyclone CJ, and even the AMC SC Rambler. The Judge was also a car that a buyer could option with either a Ram Air 3 or a Ram Air 4 engine. Like their competitors, the GTOs and Judges had bright colors, striping, styled wheels, unique hoods, spoilers, and other typical for the day features that young buyers demanded. Because so many GTOs were produced from its introduction, finding a nice used example in the mid-70s was easy, and they were cheap. This brought in an entirely new generation of enthusiasts. Since the GTO was produced through 1974, this cycle kept perpetuating itself to today, where the car is an absolute legend. Yes, there's no doubt that the first muscle car is still the most popular. What's your favorite GTO from the 1965-9 era, and what's your favorite of all time? 
Let us know in the comments. Ford Mustang, 1969 Boss 302 and Boss 429 and Mach 1. Although it could be argued that any year or model Mustang during this time period could easily make the list, the pinnacle year for the original pony car has to be 1969. This was the introductory year for the Boss 302, the awesome Boss 429, and the ever-popular Mach 1. The two Boss cars were already performance-oriented, but the Mach 1, at least in base model form, was more about image than actually being a high-performance machine. But a few checks of the right boxes on the dealer order form could transform it into a street and strip terror. Along with a four-barrel 351 Windsor, Mach 1 buyers were able to order the 390 and both a Ram Air and a non-Ram Air 428 Cobra Jet, plus the ultimate performance engine, the 428 Super Cobra Jet. In addition to these exciting sports roof models, the Mustang hardtop could also be upgraded to the stylish Grande. Along with these models, exciting new colors, options, and trim levels were also available. Although there's a lot of information readily found on these 69 Mustangs, we won't discuss it in detail here. We can briefly say that the Boss 302 was made specifically for Trans Am racing where it did quite well. The Boss 429 was built to homologate this semi-hemi engine for NASCAR and the planned Galaxy models. Ford XX knew the Mustang would sell better than any of the other Ford models that year and NASCAR just required 500 engines available in any production car. Some of these Boss 9 cars had also successfully transitioned to drag racing. Of course, the Mach 1 was a huge sales success seen in the Ford lineup until 1973, and then used intermittently throughout the following years. All of these cars bring big interest and big money in the world of collectible automobiles. 1969 Mercury Cougar Eliminator Ford's Lincoln Mercury division had been building exciting muscle cars right alongside their Ford counterparts since the late 1950s, so it was really no surprise during the peak of performance automobiles through the 60s and 70s that they'd offer their more upscale customers something a bit different than what could be ordered at a Ford dealer. Case in point is the new Eliminator, part of the Cougar lineup. What's appeared to be a more luxurious Mustang upon close examination was a lot more. In 1968, Mercury had available a Cougar that had a special hood and unique trim, plus options you couldn't get at a Ford, like a factory installed sunroof or air conditioning. This would also be the only Ford product to have the legendary 427 engine option for its final year. This special model was dubbed GTE, and the E stood for Eliminator. The following year, the performance car market in America was as hot as it's ever been. Every manufacturer in every category imaginable was offering cars for prospective buyers. Mercury's pony car model, the Cougar, needed a performance image facelift, so the Eliminator was born. Bright colors, stripes, spoilers, blacked out grills and tail panels, styled wheels, performance engine options, four-speed transmission, Full instrumentations and deluxe interiors would certainly sell some cars, or so it was thought. While sales of a mere 2,250 units were disappointing, Mercury stuck with the Performance Cougar offering in 1970, where 2,268 cars were eventually sold. In our opinion, this is one of the best-looking muscle cars offered by Ford during the 1960s. Mopar, any Hemi car. Hot Rodders knew this basic engine design had a ton of appeal. They also knew what specific Hemi engine had the most performance potential. Because the muscle car era was now in full swing, engineers only used these engines for all-out racing or to offer a limited production temperamental streetcar that was really a chore to own and drive on a daily basis, particularly in colder or humid climates. The first street Hemi was built for the 66 model year, and it was available in Dodge and Plymouth cars of various sizes. Unlike the decade prior, Chrysler would not offer this engine as an option. Due to a number of reasons, the performance car era wound down almost as quickly as it started. 
By the end of 1971, a Hemi would no longer be available. These engines ruled the streets and also the various sanctioned racing events around the country. Today, any car with a Hemi, especially if so equipped when it was new, is highly coveted. Even cloned Hemi cars, if done right, are highly desirable. Not everyone can afford an original, and some people wouldn't want one because of their high value. So a clone is a great way to go, especially if you want to drive and enjoy the car. A Hemi-powered engine option was available for many Dodges and Plymouths, so to find a solid project car that could have been ordered back in the day with one is getting tougher, but it's still obtainable. Honorable Mention 1967 to 69 Plymouth GTX. By 1967, Chrysler's Plymouth division, best known for offering cars at the entry level and mid price market range, was looking for a car to boost their sales numbers. Enter the GTX. Based on the current and highly successful B body, as it was known internally in the engineering halls at Chrysler, the Plymouth Belvedere and Satellite did well in previous years, taking a considerable market share from the other domestic auto companies in this size classification. By now, the muscle car wars were being waged in dealer showrooms as well as on the streets and tracks of America. The GTX was a performance car from any angle and was available as both a hardtop and a convertible, both very handsome in appearance. Standard was the 440 Super Commando engine making 375 horsepower, backed by a torque flight 3-speed automatic. The option list on this performance muscle car was extensive. According to the original factory literature we consulted while researching this awesome car, the Hemi engine could be optioned in 1967 in the B-body Plymouth lineup, but only in the GTX. To distinguish the GTX from its newest cousin, the new for 68 Roadrunner, which was also a performance machine, the GTX would get the dual side accent stripes, available in five different colors. In 1969, little changed, except the GTX lost its side accent stripes. Inside, these Mopar muscle cars featured a revised gauge cluster and instrument panel, updated steering wheels and other appointments. Honorable mention, 1968-69 Ford Torino and Mercury Cyclone. Ford was fighting hard by the late 60s to still dominate every form of racing, as was Chairman Henry Ford II's desire. The domestic mid-size muscle car scene was huge for all the auto companies, so the popular Fairlane models of the early to mid-60s evolved into the Torino, an upscale series that was new for 68. As was customary at Ford, the Mercury line usually evolved with the Fords, and that was the case in 1968 when the Cyclone was still the performance model, but the more sedate passenger car line would be called Montego. The Comet name survived on basic models only. A new body style was also seen in showrooms of both marks in 1968 with the advent of the sports roof, or as they were known by enthusiasts, the fastback. Ford ran both at NASCAR and quickly discovered that they were more aerodynamic than previous cars. Yes, the convertible and the traditional two-door hardtop bodies were also available for both series, but the fastbacks captured the imaginations of both Ford and Mercury buyers during the last two years of the 60s. Mid-year in 68, Ford debuted the 428 Cobra Jet engine and the Torinos and Cyclones, and they overshadowed the competition. Many of these cars still had the ever-reliable 390 between the shock towers, and there were many easy ways to increase their power output. The 69 models were essentially the same except for the usual styling updates both inside and out. But two new models became available. Two that would be Ford's entry into the budget muscle car field. The Fairlane Cobra, which could be ordered as either a fastback or an attractive hardtop. And the Cyclone CJ, only available as a fastback. Both had the 428 Cobra Jet on board, along with a 4-speed manual trans as standard equipment. Both the Torino and Cyclone Fastbacks were heavily modified for the track to better cheat the wind, using aerodynamics as a strategy rather than more horsepower. The front end was extended and the grille mounted flush, the rockers were rolled under, and the cars were lowered. The Torino would be called Talladega, 
after the famous NASCAR track and the Cyclone would be dubbed Spoiler 2. The Spoiler model it was based off of was strictly a streetcar with striping and spoilers, which was a styling cue used by nearly every company to indicate to any onlooker that yes, this is a performance car. The Talladega retained the Cobra Jet with an automatic, but all had the body mods made by Ford engineers that the track cars got. They came in three colors, dark blue, maroon, and white. 500 needed to be sold to run at NASCAR, and 754 eventually found new owners. The Spoiler 2s seen at Mercury dealers had all the same aero body mods, but featured a 351 four-barrel Windsor and an automatic. These Mercs were available as either white in color with red accents, along with famous racer Cale Yarbrough's name on the quarter panels, while Dan Gurney's name was seen on the white with blue accents models. This was just like their Cyclone Spoiler brethren. The Spoiler 2 tallied 519 sales, although some controversy about that number is still discussed today. Well, if you made it to the end, we appreciate you watching the video in its entirety. It ran longer than we usually do, but it's such a great topic. What did you guys think of the list? We know there are probably many others we could have profiled, especially from this era. Don't forget to check out the links listed below to see some of these awesome cars featured in more depth. Thanks for watching.